Hello, this is the section 5.1 lesson. In chapter 5, we introduced the idea of hypothesis testing. And in chapters 5, 6, and 7, we're going to introduce many specific types of hypothesis tests. Uh, but they're all done in the same basic way. In section 5.1, we're going to introduce some of the basic terminology and methodology uh, used for doing hypothesis testing. So first, we need to define what is hypothesis testing. Well, hypothesis testing is a formal approach for determining if data from a sample support a claim about a population. So we're going to start off by making a claim about a large population. And then we're going to go out and collect some data from a sample. And we're going to use hypothesis testing to determine if that data support the claim about the population or not. And there, there's five basic steps to doing hypothesis testing. The first step is to state what we call the null and alternative hypotheses. Uh, the second step is to calculate a test statistic. And then the third step is to find a critical value, or alternatively, calculate something that we call a p-value. Uh, and then we state a technical conclusion, and then we wrap it all up and talk about a final, and state the final conclusion. Now, different uh, hypothesis tests have different ways of calculating the, the test statistic. And in subsequent sections, we're going to talk about specifics of how to calculate the test statistic. Uh, but in this section, we're going to focus more on steps 1, 3, uh, 4, and 5, and how they're done, and a little bit about what they mean. So to illustrate the overall process of doing hypothesis testing, uh, let's, make, uh, uh, let's uh, look at this example of this claim. More than half of the students at a particular university are from out of state. So what we've done here is made a claim about a large population. Our population here is all the students at this university. Uh, and the claim is that more than half of them are from out of state. Well, to determine with 100% certainty if this claim is true or false, I would have to go out and interview every single student on this university uh, take the, the number that are from out of state, divide it by the total number of students, uh, and if that number is, uh, is less than or greater than one half, then my claim is true. Uh, if that number is less than half, then, then my claim is false. Well, that's impossible to do. I'm not going to be able to go out and interview every single student across this campus. So instead, it makes sense to, to uh, go out and collect some sample data. So suppose we went out and, and interviewed 95 students, and uh, 59 of them are from out of state. And so we might calculate a sample proportion here. P hat uh, comes out to be 0.621. So about 62% of the students in this sample were from out of state. Now, we might be tempted to say that this, uh, uh, that this data prove my claim. But we've got to remember that this is a sample proportion, not a population proportion. Uh, this, uh, this sample proportion is an estimate of the population proportion that I'm making a claim about. So this data here do not prove my claim, nor do they disprove my claim. Um, now, this number is, of course, a sample proportion. But in the context of a hypothesis test, it's also called a sample statistic. Now, this sample statistic uh, appear to support the claim. But we might ask the question, well, just how strong is that support? Uh, is it really strong support, or is it just uh, kind of some very weak support? Well, informally, hypothesis testing allows us to measure the strength uh, of this support. Okay. So step one in the process is to state the null and alternative hypotheses. Well, before we state these hypotheses, or before we even talk about what they mean, we first need to define the parameter. So when we define the parameter, we define what it is we're making a claim about. In this case, we're making a claim about a proportion, so our parameter is p. What is p? The proportion of all students at this university who are from out of state. And we stress the word all here because we're making a claim about all these students at this university, not just the 95 students in my sample. Now, the hypotheses are statements about the equality or inequality of the parameter. And we're going to have two hypotheses, the null and alternative hypotheses. 
See? So examples of statements that, that I'm talking about here include the following. Uh, the, the parameter equals some number. So for instance, p equals 0.5. Another example is that our parameter is greater than some number. Another example is that our parameter is less than or equal to some number. A fourth example is that the parameter is not equal to some number. And uh, so now our null hypothesis is going to be uh, a statement um, really of a form like this. We could think of the, the null hypothesis as a statement of the status quo. It's, uh, it's a statement that we might expect to be true if we didn't have any data to suggest otherwise. So in this case, we've got kind of two types of students. They're either f from state, or they're in state, or they're from out of state. And uh, so without any evidence, we might be tempted to think, well, half of them are from in state and half of them from out of state. And so our null hypothesis is going to be the statement that my population proportion equals one half. The alternative hypothesis uh, is a statement about the value of the parameter suggested by the data. Now in our, our data, we had a sample proportion of greater than one half, and uh, so that suggests that our population proportion is also greater than one half. And so alternative hypothesis is going to be the statement that p is greater than one half. So there's our two hypotheses. So every a uh, hypothesis test is going to have a null hypothesis, which is denoted h sub 0, and then alternative denoted h sub 1. The second step is to calculate the test statistic. Now, in the test statistic, we're going to take numbers from our data, we're going to take numbers from our hypotheses, and put them together to calculate this test statistic. Now, different types of hypothesis tests have different ways of calculating the, the test statistic. Uh, we're not going to get into all of them right now. In subsequent sections, we're going to discuss more details about these, uh, how to calculate the test statistic. But for a, for a claim about a single population proportion, like what we have here in, in uh, this example, uh, our test statistic is calculated according to this formula right here. So in this formula, we need p hat, which is our sample proportion, n is our sample size, and then p naught is the number that's used in the null hypothesis. So we're going to put things into this formula, uh, crunch the numbers, and the number that we get out we're going to call z. And we call this number z because the number that we calculate over here is going to be an observed value of a random variable with a standard normal distribution. Now in section 5.2 we're going to talk more about where this formula comes from and what all it means, so for right now we'll just take this for granted. And so in this particular example, we can uh, we have uh, these numbers here. P hat is 0.621. Again, that was our sample proportion that came from the data. Uh, N was our sample size of 95. P naught is the number used in the null hypothesis, which is 0.5 in this case. So I plug the numbers into our formula, do that arithmetic, and we get our test statistic of 2.36. The third step is to find the so-called critical value. Now, uh, different hypothesis tests are going to have different types of critical values. Uh, these critical values are just as we define them in, uh, in Chapter 3 and Chapter 4. Uh, a critical value could be a critical uh, z value, it could be a critical t value, it could be a critical chi-squared value. Uh, it just depends on the type of hypothesis test. Now, before we find the critical value, we first need to select a number alpha between 0 and 1. And this, uh, this number alpha is similar to what we saw back in, in chapter 3. Uh, alpha is called the significance level, uh, and then the number 100 times 1 minus alpha percent is called the confidence level. Now these are the same uh, terminology and same notation that we used in chapter 3 when we talked, or chapter 4 when we talked about confidence intervals. Uh, these numbers alpha and the confidence level have slightly different meanings here in hypothesis testing than they did in confidence levels uh, or in confidence intervals. But uh, informally, we can think of the confidence level as a measure of how confident we want to be in our final conclusion. We're never going to be 100% confident, 
Um, and so we need to have some measure of just how confident we are. Okay. So now once we have uh, selected our significance level alpha, um, for a claim about a single population proportion, here's how we find our critical value. So first we look at the form of our alternative hypothesis. And our alternative hypothesis is always going to be one of these three forms. And if we have the form p is greater than a number or p is less than a number, then our critical value is a, a z-score, and specifically it's z sub alpha divided by 2. If our alternative hypothesis is of this form, p not equal to p not, then our critical value is z sub alpha divided by 2. Now for each one of these forms of the alternative hypothesis, we also have a critical region, which is defined by our critical value. And so here we see how to find those critical regions um, in, a, um, in, a, in a, a test such as, or in a form such as this first two, we see that we have just a critical region is a single interval. Um, in this last form, the critical region is a union of two intervals like this. And so in this claim, let's choose to work at a 95% confidence level. A 95% confidence level is the default confidence level. And so that means alpha is 0.05. Now our alternative hypothesis was p was greater than 0.5. So we have this form. So our critical value is z sub alpha. So z sub 0.05 is 1.645. And then our critical region is right here, the interval from 1.645 up to infinity. Now the fourth step is to state the technical conclusion. And we're going to use that critical region to come to our technical conclusion. The technical conclusion is one of two statements. Either reject the null hypothesis or do not reject the null hypothesis. And the criteria that we use for which of these two conclusions, technical conclusions, we reach is this. First says we reject the null hypothesis if the test statistic falls into the critical region. And we do not reject the null hypothesis otherwise. So we're simply going to ask ourselves, does the test statistic fall into the critical region? If it does, then we reject the null hypothesis. If the test statistic does not fall in the critical region, then we do not reject the null hypothesis. So in this particular example, our test statistic is z is 2.63. Our critical region is the interval from 1.645 to infinity. And so we see that our test statistic does lie in the critical region. And so we use our first criteria to come to the technical conclusion of reject the null hypothesis. Now, this uh, conclusion is called the technical conclusion because it doesn't mean much of anything to anybody uh, other than, than the person doing the, the analysis. And so the last step is to state the final conclusion in non-technical terms. And so to come to, our tech, uh, to come to our final conclusion, we're going to look at two things. Number one, the technical conclusion, which is either reject or do not reject the null hypothesis. And then we're also going to look at our original claim and ask, does that original claim contain equality? And if it does, then we're going to use one of these two final conclusions. If the original claim does not contain equality, then we're going to use one of these two statements of the final conclusion. Okay. So now by the original claim, we don't mean the null or the alternative hypothesis. We mean the original claim as it was stated uh, in mathematical no notation. So in this particular example, our claim was that more than half of students are from out of state. So in mathematical notation, it's the claim that p is greater than 0.5. Now in this particular uh, example, this claim is the same as the alternative hypothesis, but that won't always be the same. And so when we look at the original claim, we don't look at just the null or alternative hypothesis. We go back to the original claim and state it in mathematical notation and ask ourselves, does that claim contain equality? In this case, it doesn't, because it was simply p is greater than, than 1 half. And uh, so we're going to look at this column here. And our technical conclusion was to reject the null hypothesis. 
And so our final conclusion is this. The data support the claim. So our sample data appeared to support the claim. And our hypothesis test uh, indicates that the, the strength of the support was strong enough uh, for us to conclude that the data do indeed support the claim. Now, <clears throat> this, uh, this interval method is one way of coming to the technical conclusion. Another way of coming to the technical conclusion is called the p-value method. The p-value is going to be a probability, hence the name p-value. And uh, this, uh, this probability is going to be an area underneath an appropriate density curve. And the, the density curve that's appropriate is the same density curve that the critical value comes from. It's also the same uh, distribution from which the, uh, the, the test statistics come from. And so in a, in a claim about a single population proportion, the test statistic was a z-score. Uh, so it came from a standard normal distribution. And so our p-value is going to be an area underneath a standard normal bell curve. And exactly how we calculate that p-value all depends on the form of the alternative hypothesis. And so if we have the form p greater than a number, then the p-value is the area underneath the standard normal bell curve to the right of z. And this type of test is generically called a right-tailed test. If the alternative hypothesis is that p is less than a number, then the p-value is the area underneath the standard normal bell curve to the left of z, the, the, the test statistic. This is what we call a left-tailed test. Now, if we have an alternative hypothesis p is not equal to some number, then the p-value is twice the area to the left or right of z, whichever of those areas is smaller. And this type of test is called a two-tailed test. Now, we use the p-value to come to the technical conclusion using these criteria. Number one, we reject the null hypothesis if the p-value is less than alpha. And we do not reject the null hypothesis if the p-value is greater than alpha. So there's no critical region here. All we have to do is compare that p-value to alpha. If the p-value is less than alpha, then we reject the null hypothesis. Otherwise, we do not reject the null hypothesis. Now, this figure here illustrates how to calculate the, the test statistic, or excuse me, how to calculate the p-value. So in a right-tailed test, we have an alternative hypothesis of p greater than some number. And so our, here's our test statistic. Here's our standard normal bell curve. And so the, the p-value is the area underneath that bell curve to the right of z. And so we see why this is called a right-tailed test. Uh, in a left-tailed test, we have alternative hypothesis p less than some number. Here's our test statistic. The p-value is the area to the left of that. Now, in a two-tailed test, things are a little bit more complicated. Um, uh, in, in a two-tailed test, our test statistic um, could be negative or it could be positive. If we get a negative test statistic, uh, then the area to the left is smaller than the area to the right. So we find that area to the left, take it times 2, and we get our p-value. If our test statistic is positive, then the area to the right is less than the area to the left. So we find that area to the right, take it times 2, and we get our p-value. Okay. So going back to our example, uh, our alternative hypothesis was the statement that p is greater than 1 half. And so this is a right-tailed test. And so from our figure, we see that our p-value is going to be the area underneath the bell curve to the right of the test statistic. Our test statistic was 2.36. And so if we go to table C1, our z-score table, and look up z equal 2.36, we're going to find that the area to the left is 0.9909. That's the area of the unshaded region down here. And so to find the area of the shaded region, we subtract that from 1, and we get 0 0.0091. So that number is our p-value. Now to come to our technical conclusion, we simply compare that p-value to our significance level alpha. Again, our significance level is 0.05. In this case, the p-value is less than alpha. And so the technical conclusion would be to reject the null hypothesis. Now, that's the exact same technical conclusion that we, 
we reached using um, critical regions and uh, and then from from this technical conclusion we would come to the same final conclusion as we did using critical regions so again the p-value method is just an altern alternative way of coming to the technical conclusion and in either method we should come to the exact same technical conclusion and the exact same final conclusion